So this has been a terrific conversation. I have enjoyed this tremendously because we've pasted together a whole bunch of stuff I've never pasted together before. Hi, welcome to Morning Talk. Today, my conversation with Howard Bloom. Howard allowed me to interview him if I could figure out how to record a WhatsApp conversation as he walked through Central Park. So that's what we did. Uh, you'll see the format is that way. And Howard is stopping and talking to dogs on the way and petting dogs. Um, it was a really, really enjoyable conversation. I chose to sort of center it around sex because I thought Howard would be really honest with me, and he was. Um, so very enjoyable, um, for me and for him as well. Actually, he said that the conversation, um, kind of helped him put together some things that had been floating around in his brain. So that felt amazing. Um, he expresses some controversial opinions, uh, and thoughts, um, in the interview. I am not going to censor anybody that I interview, so it's all in there. And, um, so just a, a word of warning there. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Like, it, it, it was one of the most enjoyable conversations that, that I've had, just for its, just for its sheer uniqueness. Uh, and I would talk to Howard Bloom again in a second. So like and subscribe if you want more of this kind of content. And thanks for watching. Howard Bloom, welcome to Morning Talk. Uh, well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Um, I'll first tell you why I was interested in speaking to you. Your um, your interview on Joe Rogan was uh, w was quite thrilling to me. <laughs> uh, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, it was thrilling. I, I actually hadn't heard of you until then. I've, uh, it was it's been quite a while since I've listened uh, to that for the first time, but. Uh, a, a few of the things you said struck me, and, and one of the things I appreciated was your, your kind of gleeful um, uh, heresy, uh, you know, um, and I've thought about it because you don't, you don't fit a mold, and um, one of your personal slogans is the truth at any price, even the price of your life. Which, right, exactly. Which was great, and, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought it tied in with something I've thought... Uh, which is that living life without ideology is is an extremely difficult thing to do, and that statement seems to me to be um, to to be saying that you're trying to live life without uh, ideological possession. Would that be would that be accurate? To well, say? that's that's not an, that that's not entirely true because okay. you do need not ideology. You need a perceptual framework. Yes. Um, in order to see what things are important, when things are less important, there's this thing called clumping. You're, uh, you, we take in amounts of information that are so vast every day that it's in the terabytes or petaflops or something like that. Yeah. Um, and we make sense of the information that we take in through something called clumping. And why? Because we only have seven slots in uh, temporary memory. Right. And temporary memory is what we operate with. It's yeah. our desktop. I think I have uh, even less, memory. but... <laughs> so, me too. Um, so, the more pumping that takes place, the better. Yeah. And ideologies or ideas or paradigms, um, whatever we want to call them, are giant clumping right. mechanisms. For example, you know that uh, my primary tool, one of my primary goals, is to have a really big picture point of view of virtually anything. Right. Um, whether it's politics which I comment on all the time for uh, Coast to Coast, the highest rated overnight talk radio show in North America, um, or uh, theoretical physics, or evolutionary biology, or information science, no matter what the topic, it all fits into a big picture. Mm -hmm. And 
the big picture I created started when I was 12 years old. And uh, my parents were thinking of, uh, this has to do with clumping, by the way. Okay. Um, my, my parents uh, saw that I was miserable in public schools and uh, offered to send me to a private school. But they had to send me for a, an interview with the headmaster. And I was an arrogant little bastard at 12 years old <laughs> and said to the headmaster, I'll only come to your school on the following condition, that you reverse the order in which you give me the science courses so that you give me physics first, because that's a big bang, and the birth of elementary particles and atoms. You give me chemistry second, because that's the birth of these incredibly intricate dances that atoms do when they socialize with each other that you give me biology next, because that is what these incredibly complex molecules do when they make life, that you give me anthropology next, because that is the formation of human societies, and that right. you end it with history, because that brings it up to date. Right. And uh, so I had a narrative framework, a Darwinian framework, in mind at the age of 12. God knows why. Yeah. God knows how. Well, and uh, then, yeah. Oh, I was going to say. But wait, the clumping, oh, okay, keep the going, clumping yes. part. The clumping part is. So when I was in college, I got incredibly confused. I just couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle the stuff on 17th century English poetry and art history and normal history and biology and physics. It was all just a jumble and un, uh, undealable unhandleable right. jungle in my brain. So I took three sheets of paper and I scotch taped them together um, and started a timeline and discovered little things like things, all of a sudden things made sense. Yeah. For example, in history, you found out that in 1600, the British um, started the British East India Company and started trading um, with India, among other places. And... Um, you also found out, well, that in 1680, Andrew Marvel wrote an incredible poem to his coy mistress. And he talks about, uh, thou on the rivers Gange, what rubies find. Well, where did, the in where did the awareness of the rivers Ganges come from? Right. It came from the trading of the British East India Company. Yeah. And he says, nor would I love at lower rate. What is this concept of rate in the middle of a poem? Rate is a mathematical concept. It's yeah. an arithmetic concept that the guys of the British East India Company used to figure out their rate of return, for example. Right. Um, yeah. And that was pervading his poem. So yeah. all of a sudden, if you have these things on a common tie line, you could see their relationship. And yeah. eventually, uh, the, the, eventually, that timeline became 12 sheets of paper, and then it went up into my head, and I never needed the paper since. Right. Well, the point of this is, this, this entire big picture view is a way of clumping. It's mm -hmm. a way of clumping phenomenal amounts of information mm -hmm. into a few simple principles. Yeah. And we humans need that. Now, we call, we call the larger systems into which we clump things paradigms. Or if we get, uh, if we're willing to kill other people about them, uh, ideologies. <laughs> um, but one way or the other, Arch let's hope archetypes. we don't have to kill any. Yeah. So let's hope we don't have to kill anybody anytime. But it is important to have these big overarching ideas that allow us to clump. Yeah, it's true. It seems very true to the way that our brains actually work. It's all about salience and and relevance and and you know. I, I, I have such a, it gets so annoyed at the idea of our brains as computers storing data, you know, as, as spreadsheets, because when I was younger, I used to always, uh, I used to always feel that I was supposed to be able to, if I was a smart person, I was supposed to be able to just learn, you know, and, uh, and obviously the brain doesn't work that way. I've learned so many things out of, out of interest and out of necessity. And that's what you're doing is, is you're connecting things so that they actually are, are meaningful and relevant. And in, in terms of ideology, yeah, like, uh, I, I, I don't think we can avoid ideology entirely, but I think when, one of the things that I, I feel is true of you is that 
you're aware of the ideology and you might even say, hey, that's a good point in the ideology, but at the same time, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> like there's always a little bit of that, uh, there's always a little bit of that independent thinking and that independent spirit in the way that you're kind of looking at it. Um, right. Well, I, I have a, an explanation for that. When I was a little kid, nobody wanted to have me around. My parents didn't have any time for me and scarcely operated as parents at all. The other kids wanted to have nothing to do with me whatsoever. And so I've been left out of normal social groups my pretty much my whole life. And that's given me a very special role. Um, I exist in the cracks in between social groups. My job is to see the things that uh, other people don't see hmm. because most of us see through the eyes of others. We see with a lens that's fashioned by our peer group and the right. pressures it puts on us. Yeah. I don't have a peer group. Right. So, and that's a huge advantage yeah. not to have a peer group. Uh, so you can see again, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and, and there are those people who are well optimized to use a peer group as a meta mind, you know, and, and, uh, right. and that can be a, a huge advantage as well. But yeah, I, I'm more, I'm more on the lines of you. I've always felt removed. I've always felt like, uh, there was something else tugging at the corners of everything that everybody was saying. There was more to it. There was truth beyond that. Um, right. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of why I wanted to speak with you. And so I usually try and pick a topic to talk about. And especially with you, I thought that was important because there are so many topics that, uh, you know, based on your books and based on your appearances in the media and all that, that we could talk about. So uh, I, I was really interested in your, in your views on ecstatic experience and your experience with ecstatic experience. And I was also thinking uh, you might be an, an interesting person to talk about sex with. Uh, no, you can, you can always... Well, they, they fit. Yeah, they you, fit. Exactly. They you, fit because sex is one of the greatest ecstatic experiences there is on planet Earth. Yeah, and um, absolutely. So, um, well, in my case, the, the per, you know, I, I've got this book coming up in April. It's called Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll. Now, wow. a little bit of background. I've, I've now published scholarly articles or have given presentations at scholarly conferences on 12 different fields. Um, everything from uh, theoretical physics, cosmology, quantum physics, to evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, aerospace. information and science, aerospace and governance. Um, mm -hmm. and I've probably left out a few, biopolitics and God knows what else. Um, and so how does a person who's rooted in science, who started in science at the age of 10, with theoretical physics and microbiology, and who compiled his first scientific sort of credentials at the age of 12. I built my first Boolean algebra machine. I co-designed a computer that won some science fair awards. Um, and I had a meeting with the head of the graduate physics department at my local university, the University of Buffalo, um, to discuss the interpretation of the Doppler shift and Big Bang versus steady state theory of the universe. That was when I was 12. Um, <laughs> So, so how does a person who is, who's, for whom science is life itself um, become involved with the ecstatic experience? Yeah. And, and, and uh, that's not entirely a question I can answer, but it starts with the fact that interest started at the age of 12. I realized that there was something really missing from my Jewish synagogue. The synagogue was set up like a Lutheran church, and it had uh, wooden pews, very hard wooden pews, with very, very narrow spaces in between them so that you had to walk sideways to get to your seat. Um, and you were basically penned there and you stood up when the rabbi told you to stand up and you recited when the rabbi told you to recite yep. and you sat down when the rabbi told you to. Sounds good. And there Catholic. was something, yeah, well, there was something desperately missing from this and it was the ecstatic experience. Now, how I knew the ecstatic experience was missing, how I even knew about the existence of the ecstatic experience, I have not been able to figure out. Right. But when I was, but from that time, I was on a hunt for the ecstatic experience. Yeah. And this fits into science. Less. Because the, 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 the aspiration of science to omniscience, the aspiration is to understand everything. Yeah. And 
the mo- one of the most, you know, the two rules that you were talking about when you talked about the truth at any price, including the price of your life. Um, well, the two, th- th- this book appeared when I was 10 years old in my lap. I don't know where it came from. Usually, you know, the location of all of your parents' books. I didn't know where this one came from at all. And I opened it up and it said, uh, the first two rules of science are these. The truth at any price, including the price of your life. And it gave the example of Galileo. And it told the story of Galileo all wrong, thank goodness, because I needed a mythic vision in which Galileo had had courage and refused to give up on his truth. Love it. Which wasn't the case. He actually he actually bargained with his friend, the Pope, and got, um, I think, about nine years of house arrest if uh. he gave up on all of his if he gave up on all of his ideas and said that his books were false, wow. um, which he did. Wow. So, but the mythology but was... that's not the way. Yeah. Yeah. The mythology. I needed a myth of. There's another puppy dog. Oh, this one's very, very cute. Uh, yeah, it's a puppy <laughs> in the middle of a, an interview. Yes, he's that's adorable. I, yes. wish, I wish I could see him. him. He's pulling the, he's pulling, he pulled the headphones <laughs> out. So, there, we got him disentangled. This Let me is put amazing. my headphones back in so I can hear. This is so, amazing. Well, the second uh, rule of science was things under your nose. As if you've never seen them before, right? And then proceed from there. So it means that one of my jobs, at least in science, is to look for the things that we take for granted, and because we take them for granted, are invisible to us, right? And yank them into the realm of science, right? And and the ecstatic, the mystic experience is one of those things that's right under our nose. I mean, right. religions all over the globe, wherever there are human beings. Well, and it, yeah. If, if I could, uh, that, that made me have a thought there. That's, that's very interesting because, yeah, you would think the ecstatic experience was quite separate from science, and yet uh, a big part of science is getting outside yourself, which is exactly what is implied by that. You know, look at things as though you've never seen them before, and the ecstatic experience is definitely a way to get outside of yourself and tap into your Dionysus instead of Apollo kind of Anyway, keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a, that's a good one. That uh, Nietzsche and his Dionysian versus uh, Apollonian. Yeah, that's uh, um, that's well, uh, well, John and Len- John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Anyway, keep going. Really? Okay. <laughs> well, so yes, that's a very very interesting way of looking at it. That uh, <laughs> Paul was Apollonian and John was Dionysian, yeah, or that's something a, that's of the sort. I, that's how I see it. That's very neat. Uh, it's a very interesting analysis. Well, I'm a musician. So, I'm a musician at, who's always been more more Paul McCartney, and I wanted to get my crotch in there somehow. Uh, and and uh-huh. so it's, it's been a la- <laughs> it's been a lack that I have also felt. So I can strongly relate. But I'm sorry for interrupting you so many times. Well, there was the, no no. It's I who am interrupting you. So um, when I was 15 years old, by now I'd been into this business of the. Uh, feel it well no when i was 14 something happened and i heard of a book called the varieties of the religious experience and this sounded right up my alley and in those days we didn't have amazon so it took me four months to track down a copy of the book Mm. and when i finally got it it felt like william james in 1902 had sent me a a message in a bottle Mm. um a message in a time capsule he laid out a whole bunch of experiences that were, he said, uh, borderline pathological. For example, uh, Fox, the founder of the Quaker movement, um, saw rivers of blood running down the hills near Litchfield um, in England. Well, this is delusional. Rivers of blood? No, I'm sorry. There'd be a historical record if such a thing had happened. This was positive delusion. And and St. Teresa who felt Christ coming through, Christ and angels, coming through the stone walls of her cell at night when she was sleeping, her stone cell, and felt herself pierced with a spear by an angel and taken up to the highest mountains overlooking the entire earth in the embrace of God, and it was an ecstasy unlike anything she'd ever felt in her life. And what William James said was, these experiences are pathological, but in the hands of some, pathology can change the course of history. Madness can change the course of history. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was a clue. 
And then when I was 15, a film came out called Black Orpheus. Mm -hmm. And the film showed Macumba rituals in South America. A Macumba, a Macumba ritual is a trance religious ritual in which the drummers are drumming like crazy, the music is going like mad, and and Jesus or uh, or the god of thunder, Chango, the Yoruban god of thunder, comes into your body and takes you over and you end up going into what looks like an epileptic fit and writhing on the floor. Mm. And that was the first time I'd seen what I was after. Um, and it became an important role model. And then when I was 16, um, I was in high school, in this terrific high school that my parents got me into. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was as unpopular as I'd ever been. But the fact is that when you take a bunch of very good-looking white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kids, they all vie for position as president of the class, the vice president of the class, the treasurer and the secretary. Yeah. And, uh, but when it comes to actually getting anything done, they're clueless. Right. So, so if you, despite all your social isolation, have a good idea of how to get things done, they'll let you do it because they want it off their hands. Right. So they elected me the head of the school's program committee for two years in a row, which means that we had uh, five school assemblies a week, and I emceed all of those assemblies, Wow! and I programmed two of them. Wow. So, so it got me used to going in front of an audience of 350 people every, every day. The first two months, scariest you could possibly imagine. On stage, it was a major problem, and it became totally natural. And one day, right. the juniors came to me, and they said, we're about to have a dance. Could you please advertise it for us? And didn't realize the irony of the situation. If you had anything resembling a party anywhere near Buffalo, New York, the people putting the party together hoped that I would park myself someplace conveniently out of the way like Cleveland or <laughs> uh, Minneapolis. Yeah. So despite the fact that I wasn't going to be welcome at this dance, I put a piece of music on the turntable behind the stage, and I went up on stage. And I can't choose my parents would try to make me normal. And one of their tools for making me normal was sending me to dance class. Yeah. And I could not learn anything. I could not learn the box step. I couldn't learn the fox trot. I couldn't learn the waltz. So I can't yeah. dance. But mm. I went in front of this audience and I danced. Mm. And because it's me, and I'm incompetent at things like dancing, it wasn't like anything you've ever seen in your life. It was right. like a Looney Tune drawn on LSD. Um, <laughs> and I saw the... I saw the eyes of these kids who were me widening, and I saw their pupils dilating, and I saw their faces melting, and I had an out-of-body experience. I was on the ceiling watching all of this. Wow. And, uh, and I saw this energy congeal. The energy of the people lost their individuality in the audience. They congealed like a big amoeba. That amoeba reached a pseudopod to me like a tunnel. The energy of the entire audience went through me as if I were an empty pipe. It went to some place around my head. It was utterly transmogrified there, yeah. and it poured back out to the audience in a continual feedback loop. And it was an astonishing experience, and I was watching from the ceiling. Then wow. the audience did something that it only did once this one time in my entire time in that high school. It surged down to the foot of the stage. It did this as if it had been practicing it forever. It had never done it before. <laughs> it surged down to the foot of the stage. They picked me up on their shoulders. They carried me out of the auditorium. Remember, me, the most unpopular kid in the school. Right. Um, and they carried me uphill to the building up above where we had our classes. Mm. So there was my own first experience of the ecstatic. Mm. However, until I was writing, um, uh, Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, A Search Your Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll, the upcoming April book, I didn't realize that that was my own personal experience of the ecstatic. Right. Um, but, I, but I would use that experience to understand my rock and roll stars eventually, mm. once I, as unlikely as it seemed, uh, would move, well, would do my voyage of the big my 20 years in pop culture, my 17 years 
heading the biggest PR firm, founding the biggest PR firm in the music industry. Right. So the ecstatic experience is something that we in science have to try to... At this point, I reached the maximum recording length on the audio software I was using based on the limitations of trying to record a WhatsApp conversation. Howard was very understanding, and we got going again right away. Thanks for your patience. I'm recording again. Um, so my... Um, Actually, yeah, uh, I wanted to, uh, in terms of ecstatic experience, I wanted to ask you a question about that. Um, do you think, uh, this is a bit of a leading question, but do you think that part of the reason uh, you were able to achieve that ecstatic experience at 12 years old was that you, um, that it was a non-analytical experience? In other words, if someone had gotten up there who had, who had thrived in dance lessons and had a framework through which to move, uh, or in which to move, um, it seems to me very likely they would not have had that analytical, ex or that, sorry, non-analytical ecstatic experience, and they wouldn't have united the crowd because the crowd might also be in analytical mode. Does that resonate with you? That makes absolute sense. Yes, absolutely. And other, but somebody asked me, I was sitting, I work at a cafe called the Chocolateria, and mm. it's where I write my books these days. And a, a reasonably attractive woman came and sat down near me. And eventually we started a conversation when I got a few free seconds. And it turns out that she is the uh, electronics publishing book editor for, I think, Oxford University Press. Wow. And she said, and, and here I am with, you know, with scholarly stuff in 12 different fields, which is a little bit unusual. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've never heard of anybody do that before. And she said, well, what is your training in? And all of a sudden, something occurred to me that's directly in line with your question. I don't have any training in anything. I've had to learn all of these things myself. Hmm. And that's an astonishing privilege. Because when you are trained, somebody tries to homogenize you. As you were describing with the dance steps. Yeah. Um, if somebody tries to get you to do things the way everybody else does them. Right. And if you manage to be an autodidact, in other words, you teach yourself um, and you avoid all the training, you have not been homogenized. You have not been turned into a lockstep robot in any field whatsoever. Right. And you have the freedom to soar over those fields like an eagle yeah. and to try to see the big picture that emerges when you can see each tiny little hole of specialization as a pixel. Mm. in a big picture landscape. Well, there's a um, there's a, a shadow side to education for sure and a, and a standardization, a homogenization. Yeah, um, I don't know that everybody's smart enough to be the autodidact and then still publish, you know, successfully in 12 different disciplines. But uh, but there, for everybody, I think there is a, a tyranny to, um, well, you know, to, to the even the technology of language, there's a tyranny. Uh, but anyway. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, I mean, I experienced, I, I have a girlfriend, I'm madly in love with her. I've never experienced anything like the love that I have for her ever before in my life. It is a variety of the religious experience. It is an ecstatic experience. And I get extremely frustrated because despite a life of doing everything I could to be the best writer that I possibly can be, I run out of words. <laughs> there just aren't words that cover what we're doing, which brings us to the sexual component, because the other great, aside from performance, the other great area, or dancing, the other great area of ecstatic experience is sex. And when you're having sex with somebody, noises come out of you that you didn't, you didn't anticipate, you didn't plan them, you don't control them, they mm -hmm. control you. Yeah. In fact... And, and those are voices of you, yeah. even as inarticulate as they are, with very few words. Yeah. The sounds themselves speak of emotions that you do not understand. Yeah, not and so sex, is another, so sex is another aspect of the ecstatic experience. Mm -hmm. And again, since we live in a cosmos that has given birth to us, and in turn has given birth to the ecstatic experience, it behooves us to wonder what in the world the cosmos gets 
out of ecstatic experience. How in the world it ever arrived at giving us ecstatic experience. Right. What the role of ecstatic experience is in our lives. I'm rolling on my sleeves. It's warm here today. Um, nice. So, so that's one of the big mysteries I'm after. Yeah. I have come nowhere near answering the big questions. Right. Um, but what I have arrived at is in Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, a search for soul and the power bits of rock and roll, along with a bunch of adventure stories on Michael Jackson, Prince, and the other people that I worked with, Bob Marley. Um, but remember my perspective. I'm looking at things through the lens of science, and there's a, a phrase that there's a guy named Robin Fox. Robin Fox is the founder of the anthropology department at Rutgers University. He's the author of some very highly respected um, books on mm. marriage and and uh, marriage rituals or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the Red Lamp of Incest is one of his books. The book that grabbed me was uh, um, The Imperial Animal. And Robin mm -hmm. Fox has been kind enough to be a fan of mine for 20 years. Mm. And Robin Fox introduced me to a term that I did not hear in my youth, despite all of my immersion in science. Mm -hmm. And it's participant, participant observer science. It's what Margaret Mead did okay. when she went off to Samoa. And when the Samoans elected her a tribal chief. So she got to see how that tribe operates from the top, from the very top. And for me, participant observer science means being able to have that total ecstatic experience that I had in front of an audience when I was 16, and then to be able to try to understand it in right. scientific terms, right. both having the experience and explaining yeah. the experience. And here come two more little dogs. Apollo Let's see if we can get their attention. Yes, yes, they do want to say hello. One of them wants to say hello. <laughs> Okay, so had enough uh, of saying hello. Uh, may I ask you a question? Um, this is uh, yes. I, I love this, and uh, I'm wondering uh, the 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 performance experience and the ecstatic experience, or sorry, the sexual experience are two ecstatic experiences. Are you characterizing ecstatic experience as something that's necessarily got at least two agents? Like, is there is that something that needs to be somewhat communal or? <laughs> Or this is a brilliant point. I had not thought of this before. Yes, they're the most personal experiences you can have ever, but they are social. Hmm. They are totally social. I, I try to explain to my girlfriend, who I just adore madly, hmm. um, you can take, let's imagine that we, we sit you at your desk, and over on the left-hand side, we put an empty toilet paper roll, and a thing of copper wire, uh, a spool of copper wire. And over on the right-hand side, we put one of those magnets that looks like a file. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's long and skinny. Okay, now we've got the copper wire and the toilet paper roll on one side, and we've got, I think I'm going to sit down here so we can continue, because if I head to the chocolate area where I do my work, uh, we won't have this kind of silence. Right. So let's see if I can take this off without knocking the headphones off myself. All right. So, okay. All right. So here we are in the park. So, um, but you, and nothing will happen. You could just sit there forever in between that magnet and that toilet paper roll, and not a thing will happen. Yeah. But if you take the copper wire and you wrap it around the toilet paper roll, and then you pick up the magnet with your other hand, and you move the magnet back and forth inside of the toilet paper roll, you'll generate something. Oh. Electricity. The magnet and the copper and the, and the toilet paper roll never even yeah. have to touch each other. The electrical flow comes out of the interaction at a distance hmm. between these things. Yeah. And yes, remember, the Macumba uh, ritual involved a crowd of 30 or 40 people and music hmm. and music galvanized those people and without the attention of those people you if you were the center of attention would not have been seized by chango the god of thunder and sent to the ground writhing and frothing at the mouth yeah um without that audience it was the energy of the audience pouring through hmm. me 
Interesting. Nobody touching me physically, but touching me with their attention right. and their energy yeah. that sent me into an ecstatic state. Interesting. And, and one of the things I'm learning, you know, at the age of 76, to be learning new things uh, about being in love is pretty damned amazing. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm learning is the way I adore my girlfriend lights her up. The way she lights up lights me up. The way I get lit up by her being lit up lights her up. Yeah. And it's a reverberatory loop like the reverberatory loop in that dance episode where I went ecstatic. Yeah. So you're right. This yeah. is a social thing at the same time that it's the most personal thing we ever have access to. I, I have an image that comes to mind which might sound strange, but I, I've, I always uh, go back to the idea of uh, a newborn infant breastfeeding for the first time. Ah, okay. And, That's exactly what I've been thinking about recently, because when a mother puts her baby to the nipple for the very first time, she gets a shot of oxytocin. And that ox women have described that to me, and it turns out that for some of them, that shot of oxytocin is like LSC. Yeah. It just changes them utterly. I've heard that. Now, one of the things, yeah, one of the things we know from research is that oxytocin makes a woman very trusting and she will trust in strangers. So a man, uh, her mate, will have a, um, a shot of the opposite hormone. And, mm. and that shot of the hormone for him makes him very aware of boundaries and very yeah. aware of dangers. Why? Because they're a unit. They're a synergy. Yeah. Unit, the man and the woman. They're no and the woman needs to be open. Yeah. yeah, the woman needs to be open to bonding because she's going to bond with this infant in a bond that's going to determine the quality of that kid's life right. and of hers going forward. And the husband needs to be there to set up boundaries and make sure nobody dangerous comes along. Yeah. Because in primitive societies, right on up to the societies of the Iliad and the Odyssey, yeah. a man will come across a woman and with a baby, and will swing that baby by its ankles and bash its head up against a stone. Why? Because as long as the woman, um, <laughs> as as long as the woman, um, I just had two young, attractive girls who suddenly somehow realized we were in an interview here, <laughs> and 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 tiptoed past. I uh -huh. uh, made interesting facial gestures. So wonderful facial gestures. <laughs> so at any rate. The oxytocin high is astonishing. Yeah. And one of the things that my girlfriend and I have been experiencing recently is we're in this state as if we're, a melt, we're melted in a fondue. She calls it interpenetration. She says it's as if her cells have stepped aside and made room, and my cells have, have slipped into the spaces in between them. Wow. And, and, and I think it's a very, very accurate image for the way we feel. Amazing. And we're in this state of being in love with each other, and it's like heroin it's addictive yeah and it feels so amazingly good that it's ridiculous right. and in all probability it's the uh oxytocin state I, I think that you might be i think the more powerful that state the closer you might be getting to the experience of that baby because that's the experience that yes. i'm interested in uh, yes that's what, can you imagine yeah, so, the, okay, so. the trust and the pleasure the, that that baby is experiencing that baby is is within God, you, you know what I mean? Is is living inside God in that moment? I, I that's my theory anyway. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I was saying the same thing myself to my the woman I love um, over the last couple of weeks because I was reading um, a new biography of Vincent Van Gogh, and there's and Van Gogh never got any love. There's right. only one woman who fell in love with him. And her family then thought it was wildly inappropriate and sent her off someplace. So he basically got almost no love in his life whatsoever. And he became um, fascinated at a certain point with drawings. So there's a helicopter going overhead. <laughs> so um, he became fascinated with making drawings of women bringing a baby to their breast. And I wouldn't have understood the importance of that without my relationship with my girlfriend. Mm. Because I realized that in the same way that she lights up because I just go crazy over her, and then she lights me up even further, that's what's going on with a mother and her baby. And it is divine. I keep explaining to my girlfriend, I'm an atheist, a stone-cold atheist. 
but divinity is the name of an emotion, an experience. Yeah. And and that is about as close to divinity as you get. And that's yeah. one of the reasons that the Virgin Mary and, and uh, Jesus have such a potent appeal. Mm. Because you can paint you can paint them in the radiance. You know, formally it's a halo. But in reality, I know with my girlfriend, all the things that women try to achieve with makeup, when I love to see my girlfriend without any makeup whatsoever, because yeah. all of the things that people try to achieve with makeup happen in her face. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever, ever seen in my life. Yeah. It's just astonishing. Yeah. The glow. And we, we glow each other. So plus... I have never called a woman baby in my life. I thought it was crass and crude and for people who drink a lot of beer and watch a lot of football games and, you know, <laughs> model a lot of cliches that yeah. don't mean anything. Um, well, I call my girlfriend baby and there's a reason. Yeah. And it's because apparently the way I love her has brought to the surface all of those instincts that arose so we could take care of babies. Mm. The absolute glow that takes us over when we see a baby that just lights us up. Yeah. Um, the absolute glow of interaction with that baby. Well, there's a whole set of instinctual, there's an instinctual package mm -hmm. to bond us with babies and make us find astonishing joy in yeah. them. And apparently that package comes to life when you really love somebody. Well, so it turns out, yeah. What, what, uh, what I love about where this conversation has gone is that, uh, We've we've talked about the um, the ecstatic experience of sexual love, but how it's uh, uh, how it's kind of part and parcel to uh, other other human experiences that bring in the ultimate sense of responsibility and duty at the same time. It's like it, there almost does seem to be a parallel between the between. Uh, between that and then what we were talking about earlier with science, uh, with analysis and lack of analysis, you know what I mean? Like, uh, right. the two, the two feed each other. The ecstatic experience is non-analytical. And as soon as we leave that, we're that participant observer. And now we say, how do we tend this garden? And, and how do we, how do we reliably reproduce this, this situation? And that brings in duty and responsibility in a way that's extremely non, um, that's that's not prescribed by anyone else. That that is sort of a response to this divinity. In other words, it's an act of worship to to protect your wife when she is breastfeeding. You know, or th does that make sense? Yes, it makes absolute sense because these are all part of the self organization of social units. These exact experiences. And but before I go into that, um, one of the things I've learned in this particular relationship is that my normal everyday, 5% uh, of us, this very rough figure, but 5% of us roughly is our analytic mind. It's our verbal mind. It's our rational, logical mind. Mm. And, and the other 95% is the, floor, the self below the floorboards of the self. Right. And it's the self below the floorboards of the self that's speaking when it makes all those strange noises that come out of you when you're in the sexual act. Mm -hmm. Or when you're on stage in front of an audience of people who just lose all of their rational yeah. and lost and verbal facilities mm -hmm. and are absorbed in an experience that they don't understand at all. And mm -hmm. so are you. Um, so what I've learned with, my, with the woman I love is forget what your cynical, rational self is saying. It's always going to find a way in which to try to get out of the relationship. Um, Listen to the voices from beneath the floorboards of the self. So I let myself mutter. Mm. Why? So I can hear what the voices below the floorboards of the self have to say. Yeah. And, and those voices, no matter how cynical I am, say, you are wonderful. You are beautiful. You are amazing. Um, it, it turns out the self below the floorboards of the self has a very limited vocabulary in my case. Mm. And it's a very st small stock of cliches but you should hear the way these things are said. And it's very important to be in touch yeah. with that emotional self. But the other mystery here is that the ecstatic experience is part of the bonding experience that makes for the self-organization of social groups. Right. You could see that at work in, in, with Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was a brilliant manipulator mm. or artist of mass 
human emotions. Yeah. And one of his most spectacular creations was the Torchlight Parade. And these would take place on Berlin's leading uh, boulevard, the Unter von Linden. And you'd have people uh, on the sidewalk at 10 o'clock at night, packed so tight that if you were there, you could have pulled up your feet and you were still would have remained in an upright position, pinned there mm -hmm. by the body scrunched around you. Wow. And meanwhile, down the street came a, uh, a, a batch of soldiers, a huge mass of soldiers, um, roughly nine abreast, carrying torches. Mm. And the experience lifted you out of yourself and lifted you into something higher than yourself. And we all need a feel at one point or another that we are a part of something higher and bigger than ourselves. It's mm. a desperate human need. Um, and these people are yanked into that imperium of a higher something. Mm. And, and, but Hitler has defined the higher something for them. Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer, which means one tribe, one tribe knitted together by common historical experience that goes back to the beginnings of time and common genes. Mm. Um, ein Volk, ein, one people, ein Reich, one state, ein Führer, one leader. Mm. And this is an ecstatic experience that Hitler was able to choreograph on yeah. a mass scale. So ecstatic experiences have everything to do with the formation of families, yeah. with our reproduction, with the formation of units much bigger than the family, mm. with the formation of ideologies that hold us together, yeah. to use the word we started with, um, and with the formation of large-scale societies. Donald Trump apparently takes advantage of this. His performances are ecstatic for his audience. Mm. You know, one of the, one of the ecstasies that uh, I usually forget because I'm not into sports is what happens when you watch a, a, a hockey game right. or a football game. Yeah, I'm the same you as you, so but I've noticed up. this. Yeah. yeah, so you become so caught up in the experience that you end up rising to your feet. You don't even know who made that decision because you didn't make it voluntarily and screaming yeah. at moments of tension in the game. Well, that's the ecstatic experience bonding you to a group. Mm. And then if your city wins, you are blessed with the testosterone high. And if your city loses, you are in the dumps. Right. You probably have cortisol. Um, so these things, uh, there's a competition between groups. It's constantly going on. It's a competition for position in the pecking order of groups. Right. Who's going to be number one? Who's going to win the Stanley Cup? Um, what, who's going to be the number one nation and the number one civilization with the greatest amount of influence? Yeah, um, Howard, I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to do ah, my okay. thing again here. Just a moment. I'm reaching the okay. end of my. Yeah, forgive me. This is the second time I had to reset the audio. It's the last time. Thanks again for your patience. So uh, anyway, so you were saying uh, we there's competition for that uh, to create that ecstatic state. Did I interrupt your well, thought too much? Yeah, there, there, there's competition between groups right. to be the number one group. Yeah. And that competition means a great deal to us. Not only does it mean a great deal to us emotionally, determining our balances of corticosteroids, that is stress hormones, and testosterone, um, it, the bigger our group, the higher our group is on the ladder, the more privileged each of us within the group is. With groups of ants, the largest groups make the biggest ants. Mm. The largest groups are dominant, and as a consequence, they can dominate the resources they want, the food and shelter that they want, and the result is they have the biggest dance. Well, what does that mean for Americans being either number one in the world or giving up on being number one, which we are under Donald Trump, mm. and becoming number two to the Chinese? Uh, whoever is on top of the hierarchy is going to produce, have a, the easiest time producing children, is going to have the, highest, the easiest time reproducing its its ideologies, yeah. um, its views of the world, things like democracy and uh, human rights, um, which are uh, Western values and, and especially yeah. American values. Yeah. And if the Chinese become number one, the Chinese are going to have an easier time wielding influence around the world. It's Chinese models of uh, autocracy and uh, or authoritarianism mm. and, uh, and, and a surveillance state. Um, we think we've got a surveillance state. No, it's nothing compared to the Chinese surveillance state and uh, very limited freedom of speech. And yeah. all of that is going to take over. It seems like uh, it seems like there is 
a definite strategy if you do want to control a population. If you can control reproduction and control sex, then um, it, it's kind of a way to it's kind of a way to, to maintain that power. And I, it seems to me that that it, that's maybe what religion has unwittingly done in in the U.S. is control. Uh, you know, is control the the procreation and control sex a little bit, but I also think that religion has increasingly stopped uh, giving people the ecstatic experience to make up for that. Uh, well, I, I would I would imagine that evangelistic religions are still very much in touch with the ecstatic experience. Why? Because they stress being born again, and being born again is an experience of feeling invaded by God mm. and taken over by God at least once in your life so that Jesus becomes your personal savior. Yeah. And when you get to Pente Pentecostal religions, yeah. they're being seized by the goddesses all over the place and speaking in tongues yeah. and stuff like that. But you're right. R religions, one of the uh, amazing things about religions and tribal groups in general is that each c civilization, each religion, distinguishes itself by its sexual strategy. Mm. And religions are... Each religion believes that only its sexual strategy is moral and that all other sexual strategies are immoral. Mm. And you just made me think for the first time about the sexual differentiation, the differentiation in sexual strategies that this forces upon us because we operate not just as groups in competition with each other, but competition is the greatest form of cooperation. Mm, yeah. And, and so by stretching in different directions sexually, each group is up is exploring a different realm of possibility, right? So for the for for nature and for the human race in general. Right. So Muslims allow you to have four wives. We have uh, allow you to have one wife. Right. China allows you to have, or until recently, allowed you to have only one child. Yeah. Well, I think you. And need I'm to, not. Sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I think you need to write the follow up to varieties of the religious experience and write varieties of the sexual experience so that we can get all of the all of the wisdom from all of the different uh, traditions and their view of sex into one thing, because I think we can be very critical of them all, but it is, you, what you're saying is quite interesting. We're kind of crowdsourcing the ultimate human sexuality by testing on a mass scale, uh, you know. Uh, and, and different human approaches to sexuality may prove to be differently effectual under different circumstances. Right. Well, they In have, other they words, have when to be. That's the thing, when you, uh, when, when you criticize, I mean, I shouldn't say they have to be, but when you criticize someone who's a part of a, of a religious tradition, one of the reasons they can always kind of laugh you off is that they can probably quickly bring to mind so many beautiful experiences that came about specifically because of their religious tradition. You know, so, so there's the blind spots of it, and then there's also the, the ways in which it is very human. But anyway, keep going. Well, look at the two sexual strategies of Judaism and Islam. Judaism, by the way, there are only 15 million Jews in the world, and there are 1.8 billion Muslims. So these two groups are not comparable in size by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. One is the size of an ant, and the other is the size of the Jolly Green Giant. Right. Um, Islam is the one that's the Jolly Green Giant. Nonetheless, in Islam, if you father a child by a woman and you are a Muslim, that child is automatically a Muslim. Mm. If you father a child by a woman... And that child, and you are an Arab. That child is automatically an Arab. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter how you have fathered that child. You are allowed to rape female prisoners of war. Rape is perfectly acceptable, as long as it's the rape of non-Muslims, mm. unbelievers. Um, if if you kill all the men and take all the women and rape them, and they have children, it doesn't matter what they want for their child. It's mm. all in the hands of God, and God says those children are Muslims. In fact, God says that um, those children were born Muslim. Why? Because they came from God, and God has only one set of truths, and that truth, those truths are Islam. And so the child is perverted by being trained to be mm. secular, for example, or mm. Western. Okay, that's one approach. That approach works very well when you are a conquering society. And Islam has indeed been a conquering society. Within roughly 150 years, a little bit less, of, Muslims de of Muhammad's death, um, Islam had conquered a territory 11 times the size of the conquest of Alexander the Great, five times the size of the Roman Empire, and mm. seven times the size of the United States, the biggest empire in the history of the world. Mm. 
including the European Empire, which was small mm. by comparison. Meanwhile, what's the fate of the Jews been? First, what's the sexual attitude? If your mother was Jewish, you are Jewish. Mm. Now, the fate of the Jews has been to be chased around and attacked by pogroms uh, and attempted annihilations um, ever since 2,500 years ago. Mm. A little bit longer, actually. So if somebody rapes a Jewish woman, um, and but the child of that Jewish woman is automatically Jewish because his mother was Jewish, the, the Jewish sexual approach favors or, or takes advantage of what you're stuck with when your women are frequently raped, just mm. as a matter of course. So Islam views raping women as a profoundly holy deed, hmm. if they are believers. Um, and Judaism has just the opposite approach. Even if you're raped, you're still a Jewish woman and your child is still Jewish. Hmm. You can see that these two different sexual attitudes deal with dramatically different circumstances. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, it it's very it's very interesting. Like I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't aware of some of those things, but yeah, like I guess I was more thinking about the 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 positive sides of things. But then I did also bring up the negative side of of the way that Christianity uh, prescribes sex, and that's the one. That's the one that's more real to me. I was raised in Christian uh, in Christian society, and we always had an interesting um, we always had an interesting view of sex to me because it was it, it was seen as holy, but then also uh, not n- not discussed, and there was no outlet for it as well. So there there's a I feel like there's a shadow side in in it. To the sexual practices of every religion, uh, and and so uh, yeah, I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Well, about I, that. I understand that because my first wife, um, her family was descended from the first inhabitants of the Massachusetts colony. Right. Her family traced itself back to the second wife of the governor, the first governor of the Massachusetts colony, mm. and in her family, you couldn't mention the word sex. Mm. Now, it took me a long time to realize something. When you walked in their front door, there was a cabinet of Dresden dolls. And the Dresden dolls had these tiny little waists. You know, the women had these tiny little waists. So this incredible, what what evolutionary biologists call a hip-waist ratio. Mm. That just was there to to maximize the sexual appeal. Then, and, and you walked in and met my wife's mom. And my wife used to describe her mom as uh, being like an apple on toothpicks. <laughs> In other words, her mom was a little brown thing who had no hip waist ratio whatsoever. Mm. And her father and mother had separate bedrooms. And dominating her father's bedroom was a great big nude. Well, it turned out that that great big nude was, was painted by his wife, by my first wife's mother. Wow. So what was going on here? Nobody would mention sex, uh, literally. And mentioning sex right. in front of her mother could make her mother faint. Right. Um, but there was something sexual going on here. Yeah. Apparently, when she had been young and when, her, when my wife's dad had been wooing my wife's mom, she had had one of those wonderful hip-waist ratios. <laughs> and now it was gone. And he apparently resented that. So they had all of these little dolls reproaching her oh, man. Um, with not having a kind of hip waist ratio. And then we had a her revenge, which was painting a great big nude of a young woman and planting it in his bedroom. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. my wife got pregnant out of wedlock the first time she slept with her boyfriend. And it was the crime of the century. Right. She felt that she was Hester Prynne, you know, in the Scarlet Letter, mm. and that she had a Scarlet Letter on her forehead. And everybody in her city, Kingston, New York, looked down on her, um, thought she was shameful, and it nearly gave her a nervous breakdown. Mm. That was the white Anglo-Saxon. Plus, right. she could not acknowledge her own sexual desires. Right. In other words, I mean, she had this boyfriend. The two of them t- got $50 together. Yeah. They bought a used car. The brakes didn't work. They said they used to have to stick their feet out to stop it. But it was a rolling bedroom. 
and for two teenagers who were um, sexually horny, um, it was perfect. Right. But to, in order to have sex, my wife had to drink a bottle of Jack Daniels so that she could be convinced that it wasn't her who wanted the sex. Oh, man. That it wasn't her yeah. who was having the sex. It definitely gets that it was in your the head. Jack Daniels. Yeah. Well, I would like to believe that um, it's real love, whether it be in the Muslim tradition, whether it be in Jewish tradition or, or in the Christian tradition, that it's real love that, that sends us out beyond the, you know, beyond necessarily uh, the tyranny of the past and the history and the dogma. And, and, that's, and that's one of the beautiful things about sex when there's, especially when there's love involved, is that, uh, you know, it, it would seem to me that all of those, uh, all of those tyrannies can, can disappear eventually if you kind of work towards that. I don't know. Um, well, we're lucky. I was part, you know, I have this book called How I Accidentally Started the 60s. And it's about how I accidentally helped start a movement. And then I left the country for a year. And when I came back, the movement had been given a name. And it was called the hippie movement. And we were very big on promulgating a sexual revolution. Mm. We felt that if you could be open about sexuality, that it would diminish the violence in the world. And so we, you and I come from a world in which expressing things sexually is accepted. Mm. However, the, the, the world of your childhood and the world that my first wife lived in was one where sexuality had to be walled off from normal existence right. altogether. I in other say, words, the voices that I... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, her, her experience sounds quite a bit uh, more uh, messed up than, than mine was. <laughs> I think we, we just had ah, some, some run-of-the-mill repression going on. My parents were very demonstrative people. They love each other. Oh, they, good. They, they were sexual with each other. I, I did, oh, terrific. Personally, I did not experience that. I was speaking as, in the broader tradition, but I, I was fascinated by that story. Anyway, continue. Right. Well, um, the... You know, the voices from below the floorboards of the self that I listen to all the time these days, because they give my, me my truest guide to how I really feel about this woman I'm crazy about. Um, listening to those voices without that sexual revolution would have been impossible. We mm. wouldn't have had the social permission. Not that we have the social permission now. That phrase, the self below the floorboards of the self, is a phrase of mine that I've never put in a book. Mm, I you know, like there's it. tons of my work. Well, I have this document uh 500 pages long in the computer and it's a table of contents to my body of work and it's got something like nine thousand chapters and it's called the grand unified theory of everything in the universe including sex violence and the human soul <laughs> and unfortunate unfortunately i've only written seven books and that's sort of like being the guy who's given the job of uh putting together a mosaic on the floor of hog sophia which is one of the biggest spaces ever built before modern times mm. and you know it's a temple that was built by saint helen who was constantine's mother yeah a church built by her well so far all i've had time for is to put together the first six tiles or the first seven right. tiles <laughs> now imagine somebody coming and looking to see what your grand piece of art is and you've only got seven tiles and they're all white yeah because you're doing the background you haven't gotten <laughs> to the main figures yet and of course because life is short I have two more books that I have to write. We'll see if, uh, if my health gives, I mean, you know, I'm in incredible health right now. I, I do as many as 1200 pushups in a morning Good for you. without stopping. Um, this morning, I think I gave myself a break and I only did 800 or something <laughs> like that. Wow. So, well, so, uh, so yeah. Um, I was going to say we're we're at the hour point, and I'm I'm conti I'm definitely still fascinated. Um, I like to try and keep these around an hour, and it feels like uh, it feels like summing up that uh, you know how much of how much of your life's book you've you've written uh, um, is is as good a place as any to um, to to stop. But I but I would say um, uh, I really appreciate your. Um, well, I just really appreciate your openness and your, um, you know, your candor on all of this. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is that I thought if, if Howard's going to talk about sex, he's really going to talk about it, you know, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's rare to find, you know, so um, right. I've, I've really appreciated it. Is, are there any thoughts you'd like to get in? I, I mean, I hate to cut you off, but are there any thoughts you'd like to get in? Uh, take no, as much that's time about as it, except, 
except in April, please order Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, a search for soul in the power pits of rock and roll, and then let me know what you think about it. Yeah, will do. And, and uh, I, I just... Oh, by the way, there are also two feature-length documentaries coming out. Um, you should see this. A guy is pedaling at the park, and he's got these two chihuahua-sized dogs. And they are working like their little tails off to try to keep up with him. So, uh, you're a dog anyway, lover. There are, so there are two documentary, feature-length documentary films coming out about me too. One is going to debut at um, Docs NYC mm-hmm. in November sometime. I don't think I'm allowed to say that yet because they haven't given us the date, but it'll be sometime in the first two weeks of okay. December, and then we'll see what else happens with them. Yeah. Well, so this has been a terrific conversation. I have enjoyed this tremendously because we've pasted together a whole bunch of stuff I've never pasted together before. Wow. Well, that that's a that's a real honor. It's an honor to speak to you. I've enjoyed this conversation immensely as well. Thank you so much, Howard. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Have a good night. Pleasure. I, pleasure to meet you. Or afternoon, or whatever it is. <laughs> right. Okay. See you too.